Hey Jim, welcome to Treasure Gems by Felicia Jarrell. I'm a wife of 10 years, mother of two, and owner of a multi six figure brand, Gold Mine and Coco. So, why am I here? Well, at only 30 years old, I have picked up gems along the way in regards to life, love, business, and everything in between. It's time that I share them with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Jim, welcome back for episode four. And this time I've got my dad with me. With the Girl Dad Movement, I felt it was the perfect time to sit down with my father and share some gems directly from him that have been taught to me all throughout life. I'm going to introduce my dad, David. He's 66 years old, retired Navy of 20 years, and is now the senior manager for a security company here in Tennessee. My dad, as I've often referred to him, is my wise counsel and best friend. We're going to discuss life lessons, handling business, and following God's vision for your life. Let's dive in. Hey, Dad. Hello. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining my podcast. (laughs) I know this is like, what is this girl doing? You guys, I literally asked my dad to do this episode with me all of like two hours ago. So he so graciously obliged me. So we're just going to go ahead and dive in because I don't want this to be too long. Um, so dad, tell us about yourself. Like, how did you grow up? When did you find God? Like, whatever you want to share. Oh, well, let's see. Well, first of all, uh, good evening. Good day. Good afternoon. <laughs> Whichever time span it may be that you, you find yourself uh, capturing this information. Um, for me growing up, uh, I I was born and raised in a small town named London, Ohio, Uh, probably about 36 miles um, north, northwest of Columbus. So it actually sit between Columbus and Dayton, Ohio, which were the two major cities in central Ohio. Uh, We grew up. I have five siblings, one brother, four sisters. Uh, We grew up in a household um, that was a very, very strict discipline and environment. Um, Made to be responsible at a young age, although I was very, very rebellious. Uh, But I find that uh, the life's lessons that I learned uh, back in the 50s and the 60s uh, are undoubtedly what has propelled me to be what I am today. And lessons we had to learn back in those days was that uh, you had to be strong. You had to be obedient. You had to understand the rule and follow the rule. So given that and given my nature of being somewhat mischievous, uh, I would say that I had uh, a very interesting upbringing. So, uh, you know, as time passed, unfortunately, my mother passed when I was 16 years old. I had just turned 16. And at that time, I... uh, I went to live with my grandmother, who was who was very, very loving, very kind, but very, very staunch. Uh, I've always told this story often to friends of mine uh, because I always get a chuckle. Uh, My grandmother told me, she said, there's three three requirements for you to live with me. Number one, amazingly, was keep your hair cut. Number two was to finish school. And number three was to respect my house. So that laid the foundation of how I carried my life. She was a, you know, very hardworking, hardworking woman. Um, She had four children of her own. Raised them all. She bought her own house. Uh, worked in a factory, 
until she was 65 years old. Prior to that, she did laundry and cooked, made pies and certain other things, which gave us all our foundation of a work ethic. Work for what you want. Never take for never take what's not yours. So that that is the the essence of how I grew up. Uh, and of course, I don't know. Many of you may not know. Back in the fifties and sixties, it, it was there was the racial divide in the country. So we were a product of that. We were a product of. Uh, the unequal treatment, um, the stand behind, even even as much as taught to not think beyond our inner borders. So we had to figure out life to make it interesting, to make it a way that we could prosper and and succeed in our own right. Um, After that, when I turned 18, uh, it was kind of kind of funny. My grandmother asked me, it was probably about six months before I actually was graduating from high school. And she asked me, she said, "Okay, so what are your plans for the future? And of course, I had thought a lot about it. You know, I, really, I was raised. All I knew was, hey, to work and make a living. Right. So I thought about it. I seen this movie in 1971 or 72. It was called Patton about an army general that uh, invaded uh, Germany that was, that was victorious and he was the type of guy that I wanted to kind of pattern my life after. So, you know, just being that strong, upright person, you know, tough. So I joined the military and I told my grandmother, I says, well, I joined the military and I'll be leaving right after graduation. And she says, well, that's a good choice, son. That's a good choice. I wish you well. Um, so. You know, going into the military. And obviously, you know, I, I went in the Navy and, and uh, to me, the Navy was the last military service that integrated and really became recognizable to the differences, uh, the equality. And so we. In the beginning, we we as a group, as a black group, suffered a lot of injustices, a lot of discriminatory practices. But I was just moved to excel, to succeed in some way, fashion or form. Uh, And it was kind of funny because in, in the early parts of my my career, 1972 to 74, 75, the military had these race relation seminars and classes, and they were really designed to encourage you or give you direction to simulate their beliefs. Mm. And so I was one that, having grown up in an era, of injustices and inequalities. I just couldn't fathom that. But I always, I always kind of laughed and, and, and said it. I said, the Navy made me the best human resources expert that they could ever come along mm-hmm. in <laughs> naval regulations and uniform code of military justice and rights and uh, the wrongs that they had committed. Because they sent me to every school that they could develop. And so they developed me into knowing all the rules and the regulations and what have you concerning how 
they were supposed to operate, not meaning how they operated, but how they were supposed to operate. So I took that to heart and 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 it was kind of uh, kind of amazing because every command I was in this this training, but they called it a stigma, followed me that I had all this knowledge about race relations and human resources. They called us human resources specialists at that time. And I was a collateral duty outside of your regular duty. My regular duties was as an aircraft mechanic. Uh, but it afforded me the opportunity to sit in front of the upper echelon, upper commands of the Navy, the captains, the admirals, uh, to present cases of discrimination and to fight for the rights of those of my color, and not only my color, but Filipinos and uh, other other. Asian ethnicities, uh, Indians, any uh, anybody that was not Caucasian. So it, it just afforded me uh, the opportunity to understand the whys. And maybe not fully understanding, but I had enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had enough. Uh, that kept that drive and I had a desire to make sure people were treated equally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fast forwarding, I spent 20 years in the United States Navy. Uh, I always would say, you know, I had a good time, but it wasn't the best of times. Mm -hmm. But the driving force for me was, is that at the end of the day, at the end of the 20 years, I would get paid for what I went through. And so I'm happy to say I get paid today. (laughs) Every month on time. (laughs) Okay. And so I, I, I tell a lot of my fellow friends, you know, I tell them, I said, you know, I've been retired for 28 years, so I've made back half of my money. So I live I live for another 12 years or 16 years, whatever it comes out to, I will have earned all my money back in the <laughs> United back when I was in the military. Uh so then I'm ahead of the game. Okay. So uh crazy philosophy, but that's mine. Hey, whatever works. That's man. mine. That's whatever that's works. how I I think about it. Uh, well, you have definitely let the people know about you. And I actually really like that intro. I wasn't for sure if you were going to like dive in or if you were going to be like, oh, well, I'm, you know, 66, whatever. The, um, I think it's a great introduction as far as if we keep doing these gems from dad, they establish their own like feel like they know you kind of and know your perspectives and where you're coming from so the question that i have next on here i i'm not for sure if i want to rearrange this based off the questions that i have but um the question that i have is when did you find god when how um or should we say that for another episode i'm not for sure Um, But I feel like it kind of plays a role in some of what we're going to discuss today. Okay, I I can um, I can certainly expound upon that. But uh, in the manner that I would do it, I would do it as a testimony. Okay. Uh, Because I firmly believe that testimonies. And testimonies are simply telling your story, how God interceded and intersected with you Mm -hmm. to create the better you. Right. So, as I said before, I was in the military, the United States Navy for 20 years. So I was a rebel rouser. I was a partier. Uh, I played hard and I worked hard. Unfortunately, that was not God's plan for me. 
So we have to set the basis and understand that God has a plan and purpose for everybody. That's why you were born. Whether people think it's their parents' eyes deal to conceive you, <laughs> it was really God's right. ideal. You were coming anyway. <laughs> to conceive you, he just used your parents as a conduit right. to get you into the this world right. and then gave them the charge to nurture you and, and, and raise you up mm -hmm. in a manner that would fulfill his purpose and plan for you. So... My introduction to Christianity started started back in, oh, God, I always went to church. And my, my parents always made us go to church. Now, oh, I know that feeling. there wasn't a lot initially that we got out of it because we didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot of teaching. However, we had the basis. We understood who God was. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, understanding who God is and knowing God are two different things. Right. So we, we had that foundation, although it was had several cracks in it. We had that foundation. So fast forward <clears throat> to 1992. I retired June 30th of 1992. I had sent my wife, Patricia, and my daughter, Felicia, on to Memphis, Tennessee. Felicia was then, well, she would have turned two years old then. And But a year before that, I sent them to Tennessee to get, get adjusted. We could get a house, a place to live in, and things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> so when I retired... Um, I had, I, I was, let me just say, quite a drinker. I wasn't a teetotaler by no means. But I had, well, a teetotaler is one that sips and drinks, but lies that they ain't drinking. Oh, okay, 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 I got you. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I drank, just being honest, I drank. So, one thing I, you know, I always had this, this yearning for God. Always had this yearning for God. You know, throughout my years, coming, people had would tell me, you, you're going to be a, a preacher. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. And, of course, you know, young folks, we'd say, ah, yeah, okay, sure, sure thing, sure mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Um but it come to a point that because of my doing, my doing, I got to probably the lowest point in my life. And I made a vow to God. I told God <laughs> when I retired, Lord, give me one year and I'll give my life to Christ. Now, can you imagine negotiating with God? <laughs> That's probably a sums up of how crazy I was <laughs> to think that I could negotiate. <laughs> but in my mind, I thought he accepted the negotiation. Mm -hmm. And what I'm about to say kind of solidifies or confirms that he did in a way accept the negotiation. However, it was really on his terms all the time rather than mine. Right. So in, we're going to fast forward June of 1993. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I was actually, I had a beer bottle up to my mouth and I heard the Lord. Now, this is my testimony. And I think it's going to help those out there that are, that are struggling somewhat with whatever. So I heard the Lord tell me. Now, people say, oh, you can't hear God audibly and this and that and that. And I'm telling you, no, yes, you, you can. can. Mm -hmm. So I heard the voice of God. 
Jesus, tell me that this day is required of you. So I pondered a little bit, because like I said, I would drink a beer. <laughs> so I pondered, I said, required of me. Mm-hmm. Required. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Lord, what do you mean required? Mm-hmm. And he reminded me of the vow mm-hmm. that you had made. You had that I had made to him, mm-hmm. which a vow is a covenant with God. Mm-hmm. If you ever plan on making a vow and breaking it, don't make one. Right. Trust me, don't do it. God says you will honor his vow Mm -hmm. or destruction will surely come. So he got my attention and he says, this day is required of you. So I'm like, you know, okay, required of me. You know, Lord, you want to break that down? Mm -hmm. Break that down for me a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it says, you made a vow unto me and you said give you one year and I'm calling it in. Now, this is me paraphrasing. This is me in my own terms and language. Right. He says, I'm calling in the vow. Right. Okay. So now I'm like calling in the vow. This day is required of you. So what I ascertained of that conversation was if I didn't honor the vow that I made, then death was surely to come. Right. So when that revelation came, this was on a Saturday. And I was like, Lord, can you j- give me to tomorrow? Give me, because ain't no churches open right now. <laughs> I'm serious. Give me till tomorrow because there are no churches open right now. <laughs> I said, I, I, I went to a church for a couple of Sundays. My neighbor invited me when I know where to go. Right. Just give me till tomorrow now. Give me till tomorrow. Can we do this thing? And God honored that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he take you out. <laughs> so we get to the church. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the sermon was about holiness, Mm -hmm. walking upright and holy before God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that was just hitting me all upside my head, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so I got, I, you know, I went to the church and I, they they gave five invitations at the end of service. I raised my hand for all five and they were like, we see you, sir. We see you, sir. We see you, sir. You know, I I guess you wasn't supposed to raise your hand for one. (laughs) But I was like, God, I I need everything you got. Mm -hmm. Everything. Don't leave out nothing. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the service, we went back into another room and to get ministered to. And then the associate pastor happened to be the pastor that was ministering to our group. And he said, well, young man, you you raise your hand. I said, Pastor, I said, everything God got, Mm -hmm. I need. Mm -hmm. Was that I need Pastor Moss. Uh-huh. I said, I need. Mm-hmm. I said, that. that's why I raised my hand. I said, so whatever you're doing right now, don't leave nothing out. Mm-hmm. Don't leave nothing out. I got to get it all. Mm-hmm. And he kind of <laughs> chuckled and he said, all right, young man, we're going to take care of you. So here, the, the testimony about that is, is God's loving grace and power. Right. So when I made that commitment, Then I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, because you honored Mm -hmm. the vow. Now, you have to understand that I just didn't jump out there and honor it. Mm -hmm. So God pulled me along Mm -hmm. because he loved me. Mm -hmm. And so what what I, 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 I... Kind of in my my mind, I was talking. I said, Lord, I said, look, I said, I've been drinking for 28 years. I want to be free from alcohol. Any kind of legal legal system, I want to be free from. And then, Lord, I want you to fix my marriage. Mm -hmm. Because, folks, I had jacked it up. 
my wife was at her wit's end, ready to leave me, Mm -hmm. and understandably so. And Jesus told me, he said, the drinking, automatic. Mm -hmm. He said, what you work so hard to tear down Mm -hmm. is going to take time to rebuild. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to walk with you every step of the way. Amen. So the testimony is today. I have been alcohol drug free since 1993. Amen. And mind you guys, I was three years old. So I've actually never known my father or remember, you know, I was three to ever be drunk, to ever be irate um, or anything that comes along with the state of drunkenness and all of that. So I always refer to my dad as like the Bill Cosby. I grew up with a dad that would sit and talk to me. Um, And it was because God delivered him from that. And oftentimes I like to think to myself that it was for my my purpose and for my good as well. Um, So dad, we'll speak these next few parts up just a little bit. when I was born as your only daughter, because mm-hmm. you do have two older sons, I mm-hmm. have two older brothers, we're 12 and 15 years apart. Um, did anything shift for you being a girl dad at that point? Well, the thing that shifted at that point was now I had God in my life. Mm-hmm. And I was on a road of recovery. Mm hmm. And I understood that this child needed me Mm -hmm. as to where my two sons didn't get that full benefit. Mm -hmm. So I had committed to myself never to walk out of her life, no matter what happened. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, her being my daughter knowing and understanding that she needed a father Mm. to guide her, to help guide her through life. The Bible tells us to bring up a child in the way they should go in the admonition of the Lord. So I had to bring her up. I had a responsibility to bring her up to protect her, to cover her, so that God could use her. Okay. So there was a shift once you found there, God. There was, there was definitely, knowing. definitely a shift uh, because of God. Number mm-hmm. one, I give him all the glory and the honor. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I didn't want to repeat the mistakes that I had made with my sons. Right. So when you look at Faith and TJ now, my husband and my daughter, like, isn't that like, yes. um, for those that don't know, and I can't speak on my husband's, uh, story cause that's his own life story, but my husband was raised by a single mother. And so to see how passionate he is about being present for his daughter, it always reminds me of me and my dad's relationship and how close knit we are. So I really, it's a relationship that I truly value being able to witness with them. Um, So my next question, Dad, and this is where we get into the gems. What are, if you had three to five most valuable lessons that you've learned, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in life, business, give me three to five that you feel you could apply to all of those categories. (laughs) Well, I I use the standard, if I might use that word, God, family, work, church. So God first. Mm -hmm. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Because this unlocks 
the mysteries, the things that God has planned for you. God says in Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you. So you have to know that God first, then family, family, God ordained and created family when he created Adam and Eve. He created a family unit, man and woman, and told them to be to multiply. So family becomes very, very, very important. So you must men, and I, I have to talk to the men, is that the Bible tells us to leave our fathers and our mothers and cleave unto our wives because this is what he ordained. So men, we have to take upon a wife and then understand how God tells us to treat them. And he will give you the wisdom of how to do it. He said, live with them according to knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge that God has put before us as to how to operate as a man in this world, in this realm. Work ethics. Work at what you love. Work hard. Take nothing for granted. Put everything before God. Because he also tells us that lean not into our own understanding, but acknowledge him in all our ways and he shall direct our paths. So a lot of people then that this is just David McNeil speaking. A lot of people think God wants us to be independent, but he didn't create us to be independent. He created us to be dependent upon him. So we have to under, understand how to be dependent, how God wants us to be dependent. And it's in his word. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God so that you may rightly divide the word of truth. So the nuggets for, for wisdom is your relationship with God the Father, your relationship with family as a covering, your integrity at work, and your service at church. And if you can understand and follow that principle, then you're so far ahead of the, the game. And then trust in God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. Believe God. Believe God is God. His word is true. It's infallible. It's unquestionable and walk by faith. Okay. That was some very, very good, valuable advice, lessons, and insight. I told y'all, my dad is my wise counsel. <laughs> I go to him, and as a 30 year old entrepreneur, I often turn to you for advice because you've been in management since I can remember. Um, one of the best lessons you have taught me is how to lead by example and to always choose integrity. So when it comes to being in management and then also being a Christian, also being a husband and a father and a grandfather and et cetera, how do you balance what Christianity is for you in the workplace and amongst all of those different titles? Well, understanding that a lot of, a lot of the workplace is worldly based. It's based on the world system. So my belief in God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
keeps me in check at work. You have to be a listener. You have to be a discerner. And discernment means that you have to hear what God's telling you about the situation. And then hear that. And then apply it. So for me, my belief, my stance is that God is. God says, I am that I am. And I am that I am means that I am all and everything. So in me is your safety. So I follow those principles. At work, he gives me discernment as to when I should speak, when I should hold back when I should observe, when I should take action. And that's his wisdom. Because he said, and I'll repeat this again, and it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It said, lean not unto your own understanding, but acknowledge God in all your ways, and he shall direct your path. So if, if I were to be able to open your brain and put anything in it, it would be God's wisdom and his word. Mm -hmm. Because he's not a man that he should lie. And he's going to give you the right way all the time. And he gives you the discernment to know what doesn't feel right, what isn't right, so that you can readjust, recalculate, re-envision what's going on, Mm -hmm. and then move in the right direction. Okay. So I'm going to ask this just because I want to know, and I want the world to know, (laughs) what makes you the most shocked about your daughter? And then what makes you the most proud of your child? The most shocked I guess I ever was is when she got tattoos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That was it probably the most really shocked. Really early. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that I agree with it, but it is what she decided that she wanted to do. And I explained to her that she would have to live with that mark forever. Mm hmm. Just understand the implication of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what makes me proud and, and and understand pride is the fall of man. So proud is what makes me happy is when I see her flowing in her calling. As a child, I guess around now 12 years old, it was prophesied over her that She would speak life into many people, wisdom. And she does that today. She's an entrepreneur. She's disciplined. She's organized. She loves what she does. And she loves people. So that that makes me happy. And I see her interaction with her children. And children, you have to grow on them and they got to grow on you. Mm -hmm. So it's a life learning experience that you will encounter. But you have to give them space to grow, to explore with your guidance. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Wow, Dad. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, You know, we are at 40 minutes, and I think we did good. <laughs> I think the people are going to really enjoy this. They probably are going to ask for some encores from you, uh, which I'm totally game for. 
But I just want to say thank you, Dad, for being willing to do this. I know I put you on the spot, but sharing you with people has always been a joy for me because they always come back and say just how much of an impact a simple conversation made for them with you. I mean, I remember all of my childhood guy friends were so latched on to my dad and just being around that amount of wisdom. And now my husband, like, which is just so funny because he'll ask on a weekly basis, how's your dad? Is everything okay? I'm like, you can call him. (laughs) You can call and you can ask your father-in-law directly how he's doing. Uh, But he's always so concerned about your well-being and all of that and making sure that you're good um, over here. And so this was great. This was great. I can't wait to hear the feedback about it next time. I definitely want us to talk about like business gems, like what you've learned from the businesses that you own and then what you shared with me as I've owned a business and am owning a business and running it. So um, I think that's all we got today. I hope that you enjoyed this. Be sure to leave a review, a comment, make sure that you share this. Um, If you don't mind across social media platforms, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, join the Facebook group, check out the website, all those great things. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm available there. I do not have a challenge for you guys this week. Um, If you're just looking for one, share this podcast. That will be your challenge. And um, we'll talk to you guys later. Dad, you got anything? I I just have one more thing. And I certainly want to say I'm very, very appreciative of this opportunity. Although it was kind of like last minute, (laughs) but you know, God never does anything last minute. So I do believe this was orchestrated and ordained by him for him to get the glory Mm -hmm. because he's looking for you. So I would encourage you, if you don't have a church home, find one that is teaching you the word, the foundation, the principles of God. Keep moving forward. Understand that failure is a part of life, but it's what you do when you fail that propels you into your next phase. So what I'm saying is there will be trips and stumbles and falls. Get up, dust yourself off, move forward, forget that which is behind you. Look for whatever's going forward. And I thank you. I say blessings to you by the most high God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. All right. We're out, you guys. You have a great day, evening, weekend, whenever you're listening to this. And I will catch you on episode five. Bye.